Anyway, this subject uh, is new research. I and three others have been working on this for a year and a half. Um, it's, it deals with the sediments. I mean, the, the, the sediments tell us a lot about the flood, but where are they and what message do they say? So I'm going to mainly focus in on the ocean sediments and the incredible new flood developments that result from this. Now, my field is atmospheric science. Um, I never did like geology, but when I, when I first got into this, I realized how weak we were in this because it's very complicated. So I feel compelled to have a little session on the importance of geology, mainly because I hear some people say, there's too much geology in the Creation Research Society quarterly. And for some reason, people don't see how it's important. Well, I'm going to quickly go through this because I hopefully I'm speaking to the choir on, on this issue. Anyway, geology brought in uniformitarianism in the late 1700s. You all know what uniformitarianism is? Slow processes over millions of years, accounts for all the rocks, fossils, even the climate, believe it or not. Anyway, it brought in the millions of years. Because if you look at Grand Canyon and we depended on present processes to form those layers, of course it takes millions of years. So deep time uh, came in, and this is in the 1700s. And then the church bought into it too then, thinking, well, they're objective scientists, they know what they're talking about. So the church, quote unquote, in the early 1800s, kind of naively accepted these ideas and forced them into the Bible. And both resulted in evolution in 1859. So geology is, is kind of the, what I saw uh, coming in as a non-geologist, kind of the uh, frame, uh, framework or I um, uh, can't think of the word uh, of evolution, you see, starts in geology. And all these concepts contradict the Bible and they've been accepted in the church and it's greatly few liberals within the church. And society has paid tremendously for these ideas of evolution with the foundation being geology. Uh, for instance, uh, Hitler, he believed in the master race. That's a evolutionary concept, survival of the fittest, war and all that. So we pay dearly and this, there's many things in this area that I can go into. Also, I believe geology is the last bastion of evolution. I don't think they're ever gonna give up evolution because of their worldview and because they don't wanna believe in God and follow his rules, they have to believe it all came about without God. So biology easily verifies creation. For instance, the origin of life from chemicals. They haven't even climbed the first micron of Mount Everest and that's something to, uh, there for 50 years they've been working on origin life experiments and also the the mechanism of evolution natural selection and uh, uh random mutations and natural selection is a very poor mechanism for evolution it doesn't do what they claim especially when you go into it in detail and then the gaps in the fossil record indicate that um you know that they claim that well they're the fossil record shows simple, the complex animals like the skit was, sh was showing. Well, modern biology has found out there's nothing simple in life. These early organisms, as they would call them, the bottom of the geological pile, have, are very complex. Like the eyes of the trilobite, the low, one of the lowest creatures is more complex than our own. So it doesn't really show it. Um, and also the extreme complexity in biology shows that there had to be a creator. So to me, biology easily shows the creator if you're open-minded. And geology is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is actually the major verification of evolution in deep time. Also, we have all these numerous geological challenges and they're difficult to disprove because you've got to go out in the field and examine things, read a lot, and sometimes it takes a long time to do all this and, and not too many people have the time and luxury to do this. So here's some of the geological challenges. This is just a quick list I made. The fossil order, 
we need to explain that. The origin of what's called evaporites, salt, uh, gypsum, radiometric dating, uh, origin of what's called paleosols, those are ancient buried soils, reefs, ice ages, origin of coal and oil, hundreds more. Now, the reason I know this is because I try to keep up with 50 earth science journals. Uh, I, I don't read them, actually. I look at the, what, at the table of contents and I read uh, the ones that are, are of interest to me, mainly if they have data. I look at for the data. Uh, the observations, as, as Skip was showing, it's the observations that are key to science. That's what I look for. And I can, I can easily throw out the interpretations. So there's hundreds of earth science challenges. And to solve these challenges, it'd be great to have a, a sophisticated flood model. We need a sophisticated flood model. Now, some of you might think we have one now, but since I've worked on these for 45 years, we don't have one right now. We have several ideas. Um, uh, there's actually five flood model op options the way I see it. Um, uh, two of them being uh, none of the above or parts of two or more. So anyway, I lean towards the idea of, of meteorite impacts followed by differential vertical tectonics, which means that part of the crust goes up and part of it goes down to drain the flood waters. And for a good flood model, we need to know what the the pre-flood flood and the post-flood flood boundaries are. We're still debating over that. So we're still far from the solutions of these. I have my own ideas. And so uh, to look at the big picture of this, it would help to know about the sediments. What do the sediments tell us? Well, I want to... Um, by the way, has, does anyone recognize this figure? Because I think it was published in your, um, yeah, good, uh, your magazine. Foundations is the name of it. Anyway, this is from uh, Taz Walker from Australia. He looked at the, the uh, flood from the Bible, straight from the Bible. Forget about the geological column and anything else. What would the Bible say for the flood? Well, first of all, it's a, fla uh, it's a global flash flood because the mechanisms are unleashed at the beginning and rain for 40 days and 40 nights. So in the very beginning, probably the first 40 days is probably the worst. And then the rain uh, probably let up uh, slowly. And that's probably the mechanism was waning. And so you went from a rapid rise in what I call the flooding stage. Kirsten, show up? Yeah, okay. Uh, in the flooding stage, the first part, we, I divide about 40 days. This is very arbitrary because um, that's where I think the, the, the mechanism unleashed and you had powerful turbulence, uh, powerful currents, and so forth from the mechanism of the flood. And then after 40 days, it seems like it slowed up, prevailing. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris calls this kind of the prevailing state. And in general, the peak was about 150 days. And that's where the arc grounded. Uh, the fountains and windows were closed then. So even though it's difficult to read uh, Genesis 7 to 9, uh, in this scholars who studied it uh, kind of say, well, it kind of backs up and goes forward, the, the narrative. And it peaked about uh, day 150. And then it started to retreat off the rising continents coming up out of the flood waters. Uh, the waters were retreating. First of all, uh, I need to back up. You can divide the flood into two stages, a, a rising stage and a retreating stage. So those are the stages of the flood. Flooding stage, retreating stage. And then you can you have sub phases. Um, and that's what uh, I'm referring to. Um, I'm in phase, phase four here is where as the waters were retreating, they, they were moving across the uplifting continents, moving sometimes at high speeds, and they were very wide and not very deep. And we call it kind of sheet flow, because if you're looking down uh, current, it'd be wide, maybe a thousand miles wide and five miles deep, and it had the consistency of a sheet very thin and wide. 
So it causes what's called sheet erosion on the continents coming up and um, sheet deposition where the, the sediments were deposited. And then in phase five, when more mountains and plateaus uh, poke up above the floodwaters, the floodwaters are forced to channelize, go around them like this. That's uh, uh, subphase or flood phase five. Um, so in this talk, I'm not going to deal with uh, phase five. I'm just going to deal with phase four and what phase four tells us about what happened in the flooding stage, phases one and two. Are you all with me there? It's a rather complicated. I'm going to show this again because I found out that when I present things like this, people tend to mix up where I'm at in the flood. So I'm only going to mainly talk about uh, phase four when the currents are running off the continents as white currents, like a sheet flow, and then depositing the sediments of where the currents slow down. Because when they slow down, that's where they will drop their sediments. So it's kind of like this, white currents. This is just a schematic giving you an idea. And at the same time, uh, the continents and also mountains and, uh, were rising up. And so in the Western US, um, it was rising and then it split that current, one continuing to go east and the other heading for the Pacific Ocean. And by the way, um, from a potential energy point of view, when you push water up like that, at the same time the ocean basins are sinking, you have a tremendous amount of uh, potential energy where that water is going to be rushing off the continents at high speed, eroding a huge amount of sediment. How much erosion? I've always wondered that. What would it tell us? It's telling us some rather radical things, which I will get into, which will be extremely controversial. Anyway, the global sediment distribution, I divide, I should say we, there's three of three others that are working on this. We've, uh, we've taken the, the, what the, the secular researchers have done, and we've divided it into continents and oceans, right? Shoreline. It's rather arbitrary because people have uh, extended it out into the ocean some. So that it's, so it's almost apples versus oranges when you look at all this, this data from different researchers. And I'll only deal with the bulk sediments. Sediments. I don't care about the geological column, any order that you can see in that, the fossils. I have no regard on mega sequences, Tim Clary's mega sequences. I'm not going to get into that. Eventually, I, I, we will. Eventually, we will. Um, we'll deduce the origin and meaning of the ocean sediments first. What are the ocean sediments telling us? And then we will, we're, we're working on the continental sediments because that's there's been a number of estimates over the years on the average volume of the sedimentary rocks left on the continents after it, er, the, it eroded off, the sediments eroded the top off during the retreating stage. We, we left a lot of sedimentary rocks, as we all know. You can see it in Colorado here a lot. Um, so we're working on what is what are the continental sediments? Because the, the estimates are just all over the place. And so we're, we're actually now doing our own work on this. So to estimate the ocean sediments, there is a secular research project called GlobeSed. And it has it had three estimates to be, uh, come out in the literature since about the year 2000. The latest was published by Stromy et al. 2019 in the journal called GQ. That is shorthand for geochemistry, geophysics, geosystems. It's a journal that uh, geologic, uh, American Geolo uh, uh, Geophysical Union. And they, they, they're able to figure out the sediments in the ocean. And now it, the estimates look good because they got data from the Antarctic uh, continental margin, Arctic continental margin, and they're able to see the igneous rocks below the sedimentary rocks or sediments in the ocean. So it's a good estimate. And here's what it, it, where the sediments lie in the ocean. You can see on the left the scale. 
from zero up to 17,500 meters in the red. Notice that practically all the ocean is in the very blue, hardly any sediments in the ocean. It's all it, it is rocks. Uh, but the thick sediments in the ocean are along the edges of the continents. We call it the continental margin. Uh, for instance, the Gulf of Mexico, it's up in the red, deeper than 15,000 meters. And up there, some strange areas are up here in the Barents o uh, Sea, right in here. That I have no idea of what caused that uh, thick amount of sediments, over 15,000 feet meters. And along the Northwest Canada, you have another area and in off, uh, Northeast Siberia, Bay of Bengal, and down here in the, in the Antarctic Ocean, uh, the Waddell Sea, you have another thick layer. Now these are very thick and they're very close to the coast. And here's a cross section across the Atlantic Ocean showing it. Um, these black areas are the thick sediments along off the coast. How thick? Well, you can see 15,000 meters in these dark black areas right in here and here. These represent deep troughs formed off the coast. And then you have another one off Africa. And here's a cross section of it. This is the, the what's called the Moho. It's the boundary between the mantle and the crust. And the ocean crust is about six to seven kilometers thick. And there's hardly any sediment on the, on the ocean, in the ocean. It's all on the edge. And it's in these deep troughs along the edge. And you can see how flat it is coming out. That's the continental shelf, which is, uh, it's, uh, it slowly deepens towards the sea, but it goes out uh, maybe 50 to 100, 200 miles, some cases 400 miles, then hits a drop off called the continental slope, which is this right here. And that's on top of uh, these troughs, deep troughs where the, uh, the crust sank uh, to, to accommodate the sediments coming off the uh, continent. And, and you can see the scale here, it's um, 15,000 meters, that's about 50,000 feet of sediments right off the east coast. And same with off Africa. So, uh, why did you have these deep troughs along the coast? Well, because when the continents were rising, the ocean basins were sinking. But a lot of the, the greatest sinking was along the edges of the continents, right along the edge. Um, one person said along the uh, east coast of the U.S., the Appalachians were coming up. And what's called the Baltimore Canyon off the coast went down something like maybe 20,000 meters like this, and that drains the floodwaters off at high speeds. And Lester King, my favorite geomorphologist from the University of Natal in South Africa, says that this differential vertical tectonics, where part of the crust went up, part went down, like that, vertical. Notice the adjectives he uses. So the fundamental, notice that fundamental tectonic Tectonics is the movement of the crust, either vertically or horizontally. In this case, it's vertically. The fundamental tectonic movement of global geology, not some isolated place on, on, on the earth, are vertical. We easily see this. And up or down, by the way, geologists, uh, just like a lot of science, can't write very good. So this is rather poor English, as my wife would, would say, to almost has a degree in English literature, but anyway, the vertical up or down, every part of the globe on the continents or in the ocean basins provides indirect evidence, no direct geological evidence that formerly it stood at different levels, up or down from where it is now, generally pretty level. Parts went up, parts went down. And then he continues, and he practically quotes Psalm 1048, where the mountains rise, the valleys sink down, uh, sink down to drain the floodwaters. There has always been repeated tectonic episodes, always in the same sense. The land goes up, the seafloor goes down. 
That's exactly what we expect to drain the flood waters from Psalm 104, verses 6 to 9. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so along the east coast of the U.S., off the east coast, it just dropped 10, 20 kilometers like that. That's why the Appalachians were going up. And the erosion of the Appalachians as the water was draining off, it was tremendous. I, got, I actually did a calculation of the amount of erosion, and I got 6,000 meters of erosion. That's 20,000 feet of erosion in the central, central Appalachians. And you know, that's why the Appalachians are considered old, because they're well eroded during the flood, not because they've been eroded over, slowly over millions of years. Anyway, here's the volumes, the numbers that they give, gave us in this uh, sediment project. Here's the area of the ocean. And the volume of sediments is this. And the average thickness, I'm going to stick with the average thickness as those are a little bit uh, more easy to understand. The average ocean sediments are 927 meters thick. But the continental margins are 3,000 meters on the average, 3,000 meters thick. That's about 10,000 feet thick. And then you go a little further from the margin and it's 2,189, but the deep ocean, which has hardly any sediments, has an average of 404 meters. Now, those sediments are a mixture of clays and the skeletons of, of a lot of plankton that have, been, that have sunk down to the bottom of the ocean. So, to, sh to show you that the sediments are right off the, the continental margin, indicating that they ran off from the floodwaters, I have a few cross sections here. Now, this might be a little difficult to see, but we're looking on top of the Arctic Ocean. And here's Greenland right here. And this area is Northwest Canada. And this is Siberia right here. And this is the Barents Sea right in here, which is very shallow. And I might add, they now realize that it was glaciated during the ice age, very shallow. But here's a deep trough right in there that is, if you look at this, it's 20,000 meters deep, filled with sediment, clear up to almost sea level. I haven't the foggiest idea how that occurred yet. <laughs> I mean, we just got these numbers. So, and here's some cross sections. This is off Northwest Canada. The shoreline is this vertical line right here. And here's the continental shelf. It's really flat. And then it drops. Look at how much sediment is right off the coast. A huge thickness of sediment. Now this is off North Central Siberia. Here's a shoreline way out here. And it, that shoreline is very, uh, that, that continental shelf, which is, this is, is very shallow. And that's, that was exposed during the ice age, I might add. And that's where you have a lot of, had a lot of woolly mammoth fossil bones found in, uh, on the continental shelf in there. And it hardly deepens at all for a um, thousand kilometers, 1,251. But finally, uh, I mean, the ocean didn't deepen much, but the sediments did deepen down to 15,000 meters. And this is uh, the Eastern Barents Sea. Why? I don't know why that has it. And here's the Antarctica. Here's the Antarctic Peninsula right here. And here's the Waddell Sea. And you have fixed sediments right off the coast. Uh, you look at the scale and it's around 15,000 meters deep of sediments. And here's a cross section there. And by the way, this is not like any continental shelf, they usually go out like that. They're very shallow when they drop off. This is the reverse. It shallows as you get further out into the uh, ocean like that. It's shallowing and it's deep as closest to the, to the coast because the Antarctic ice sheet has pushed the land down about a thousand uh, meters, 3,300 feet translated into uh, English units. And here's a cross section through the Bay of Bengal. So very thick sediments there. So you get the picture. 
The thick sediments are right off the coast. That's where the ocean sediments lie. And here's some cross sections to the Gulf of Mexico, and up Georgia, and, uh, and up by New Jersey. And here's the Gulf of uh, Mexico sediments. They go down to 15,000 meters. 15,000 meters seems to be generally the max depth of these, these uh, really deep troughs along the edges of the continents. And here is, this is off Georgia. It drops, but it's a, there's a shallow shelf here. And then it really drops off right in here into the deep ocean. Can everyone see that cursor? Okay. And the reason is, is because you got a plateau in there. Here's the flat shell, nearly flat. When I say flat, it deepens very slowly going out into the ocean. And then there's a little drop off and it gets to the Blake Plateau. And then there's a big drop off right in here. That's what we were seeing in that cross section. And you go up to New Jersey, and here's the shoreline right here. Here's the Appalachian Mountains. They already show up on this because the scale is so huge. And here's the shoreline, and then there's a drop off right there. And right below it, right below the continental shelf, you got 15,000 meters of sediment. So the upshot of this is that the sediment is along the edges of the continents. So I'm going to go through this quickly. We remember this is a research project, a year and a half research project. So we got to um, check all the possibilities of where this ocean sediment came from. So we gave a lot of every possibility you can imagine. Was any of it uh, early in the flood or before the flood? Very little, extremely little, because of the uh, the whole ocean has been renovated essentially. Um, and then you got two sources here after the flood, and then you got late flood channelized runoff, uh, excuse me, late flood runoff from the continents. And that's the, the, the most by far. So we analyzed, we've analyzed all these to, to eliminate those to, to try to show that this sediment came from flood runoff and not from any other source. That's the point of this. And now, this is 33 criterion saying that the flood post flood boundary is with what's called the late Cenozoic. In other words, it includes practically all the sedimentary rocks on the continent. They call it Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Uh, I, I've developed 33 criterion to judge that that's where the flood post flood boundary is. In other words, all the hard rocks on the surface of the earth are from the flood and they cemented during the flood. I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Then, how much of it accumulated after the flood in 4,500 years, assuming the Masoretic text? Some people believe in the Septuagint, which would add another 600 years, I think, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, I went through the, how much has been transported by rivers in 4,500 years? Hardly any, by the way, have added sediment after the flood. And then wind, ice, and volcanism are very small. Just recently, they found out that coastal erosion is much greater than they ever thought. Uh, they used to think it was about 3% of, of the river erosion, but now that they discovered in Europe, recently came out one third of, of coastal erosion, uh, it's one third, coastal erosion is one third of the river. So, but that's telling us that the continents are gonna erode a lot faster than they ever thought than from river erosion. Also, uh, for the deep ocean, all those plankton, they, they grow and their skeletons fall down to the bottom of the ocean. A lot of times they uh, uh, become, um, they disintegrate, disappear. But this is significant, microorganism source. It's not small and it mainly affects the deep ocean. So to determine how much of this Post flood effects can account for the, the sediments from the Globe Set project. I eliminated all these first five as being very small. But this is fairly big. And because after the flood, you had a lot of uh, overturning of the ocean. And the overturning of the ocean, uh, when you get upwelling, 
you bring all these nutrients from the deep and that causes huge plankton balloons. And when you cause that, their skeletons rain down and you can cause rapid sedimentation of the deep sea during the ice age only. Nowadays, the amount of sediment they, they, they estimate is about that much every thousand years. So the people who think that we have a contradiction in the amount of ocean sediments, 404 meters, and the rate we collect it now, about one or two centimeters every thousand years, um, we don't have to use the present rate, you see, because during the ice age, it was much greater. And I had to estimate that. And there's no way to be accurate and estimate it. So this is my conclusions. Uh, in fact, the old margin sediments are from flood runoff. That's along the margin. Practically all that is from the flood. And the margin sediments actually show, when you look at the sediments by seismic methods, they show uh, currents coming from off the continent out into the ocean. So they're, they're not going along shore, they're going offshore. So that's exactly what we expect as the currents uh, ran off the continents. So I estimated, well, let's say 50% of the deep ocean sediments are from the flood. 50% during the ice age. So that would mean that all of these sediments right here along the continental margin, 2,044 meters, and between the continental margin and the deep ocean, 2,189, all that is from flood runoff. And half of this is from flood runoff, only half. Here are the possibilities right here. Doesn't show up too, too well. So I split it down the middle 50% during the flood and 50% during the ice age. So yeah, that's the estimate of the, the, the amount of uh, sediments in the ocean from the flood. What does that mean? Okay, let's put all that back on the continent. Let's back up the tape and put it back on the continent. Today, 150, the peak of the flood between the time when the sediments were deposited and then the time they were run off and were being eroded. 1900 meters is, is the amount I got. 1900 meters is the amount of sediment eroded from the sediments collected at day 150. That's about what, 5,000 feet? Translating it in meters to feet in my mind. 19,000, 1900 meters. What does that mean? So here's this, this diagram. So at the peak of the flood, uh, it's been called phase three, which at the peak of the flood, I'm not sure what happened because you're going from depositing the sediments to eroding the top of them as the continents were coming out. You see the, the big picture, deposited on the continents, the continents come up, the tops eroded off. 1900 meters was eroded off. 5,000 meters average on the continents was eroded during the, what's called the retreating stage, mainly in what's called phase four. So here's kind of a block diagram of, of that. This block represents all the continent area, the continents, and it's just kind of a block to kind of show you how much was eroded and how much was left. Okay, in the uh, recessive or retreating stage of the flood, 1900 meters. See, this was the top of the, uh, the sediments at, at the peak of the flood, right here at day 150. Here's the current continental surface. So you eroded off 1900 meters. What's left? We don't know. <laughs> and like I said, there's, there's estimates from various sources, um, which I'll get into, but I've done a lot of erosional calculations because I have wanted to know how much erosion occurred during the retreating stage of the flood. How much? So here's some of the calculations I've done by various, there's, there's various ways to do this. Anyway, I got 6,000 meters central appellations. This is exactly what the secular scientists say too. So it, it verifies exactly what they, they've come up with too. 6,000 meters, that's 20,000 feet of erosion, central Appalachian. I did a calculation uh, off uh, Southwest Africa, Namibia, 2,500 meters. 
and in a research project in Southeast England, 1,600 meters of erosion. And you know, over the San Rafael Swell, the Northwest Colorado Plateau, I'd say it's about 5,000 meters, but I was uh, conservative with my estimates, so I ranged from 4,200 to 5,100 meters. And in central Montana, we're still publishing this, we think 2,000 meters. So I'm getting the right numbers, you see. Huge erosion during the runoff of the floodwaters. Here's some of the uh, estimates from the literature. 2,500 to 5,000 meters average for the whole Colorado Plateau. That's monstrous erosion for the 1,600 meters southern Arizona, 2,000 meters southern Rocky Mountain foothills of Canada, 6,000 meters Flinders Range, South Australia, 1,000 to 3,000 meters southern Africa, 8,000 to 11,000 meters over the Vredefort impact structure in South Africa, and 5,000 meters over the Sudbury impact structure in southern Ontario. Now, just so your eyes don't glaze over from all these numbers, what it is saying, we had a monstrous amount of erosion when the, when the floodwaters are running off. And it was deposited right on the edges of the, of the continents. And that's where the, you hit deep water. And that's where the sediments would fall in the deep water. It collected. It's a, a great picture in, in geology and the ocean sediments tell us this. So here's kind of a schematic. And this was for um, an article I did for Southeast uh, Africa. Uh, the, the comments were coming up. Ocean basins were sinking and water was rushing off at high speeds um, and eroding. And it was eroding a lot of flat surfaces called planation surfaces. This is called the African surface because it's a planation surface over 60% of Africa's plain uh, uh, flat or nearly flat, like the Serengeti of Africa. And then as it ran down, it, it uh, formed an escarpment. Then it formed the continental margin off, off the, offshore where it was deposited at the end. It actually formed a big cliff in here. Uh, and then you have a coastal plain and then you hit the shoreline and then you have this huge amount of sediments in the continental margin. So that's the big picture. You rolled off the continents, deposited along the edges of the continents. And so here's a, a kind of a, a picture of the continental shelf and slope off Los Angeles to show you the profile of it. It's, if we were to drain all the flood water, excuse me, all the ocean water uh, down, this would be the most prominent geomorphological feature on the, on the whole surface of the earth. This profile over the shelf, very flat. It, it, it deepens slowly, and then suddenly it drops off called the continental slope. That's, you know, that's a unique feature. That profile where it goes out flat like that and just drops off, is just like, like a delta. It drops off like the Mississippi River Delta. But these deltas are all around the, the continents. They ring the continents because of a sheet erosion on the continents, sheet deposition forming the continental shelf and slope. Well, if there was slow processes of erosion and deposition over millions of years, um, we should have a gradual profile. You should not have a continental shelf or a continental slow if it was slow processes of erosion deposition over millions of years which is what the secular scientists say that's called uniformitarianism it should be a gradual profile down like this to the deep ocean that's not what you have you have a a, a profile that looks like this which is is like a delta formed by fast currents moving offshore depositing quickly and then forming a drop off and Lester King says, yes, the continental margin, the continental shelf and slope are big mysteries. Why? Because the shelf is too wide. And towards the outer edge of it, too deep to be controlled by normal wind-generated waves of the ocean surface. Notice that normal wind-generated waves of the ocean surface. That's uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism can't explain this. In fact, I find that uniformitarianism can't explain a lot of geology. 
but you need to delve into geology more than the superficial level to find it because you look at things at the superficial level it almost seems like they got it all together they can explain everything but they can't when i go into uh, research areas i find that they can't explain it they, and um, even though they accuse us a lot of times that we can't a lot of times they can't either i have found so this is all during the substage four so what we want to know is how much sediment is left so this will tell us a lot about the flood the early flood what was the early flood like well first of all i'm going to go quickly into as the waters were running off the continents they left certain features on the surface of the earth in what's called the field of geomorphology how many have heard that word geomorphology just a few i like to take polls to find out what people know so that i i know i'm communicating because i i hope i wanted to find all my terms but sometimes i forget so anyway there's three things i'm going to focus in on and this is phase four during the sheet flow sheet erosion and what did it leave on the continent it left features on the surface of that earth that they can't explain like planation surfaces numerous erosional remnants and long transported hard rocks now this whole topic is one whole talk <laughs> and i hope i don't snow you um, if i go through it quick because this is uh, my i was tempted to take this out but i left it in because i said he said i had more than an hour i hope not to go much over an hour anyway here's a planation surface this is the cypress hills in southeast alberta canada it's as flat as a pancake up there and it's a high plateau it's been dissected by glacial rivers and because i found big erratic boulders from the ice age in here down in this valley but look how flat it is and that plateau sticks up 2500 feet above the river to the north and the river to the south so it's really high up in the air and it's flat and it's covered by it's covered by 75 feet of rounded quartzite rocks quartzite is a metamorphic sandstone it's one of the hardest rocks in the world and in the northwest states and adjacent canada that's the rock that is transported by the flood waters long distances which i will get into here's a planation surface in the bighorn basin and here's the sedimentary rocks you can see them dipping and something just sheared it off the same both hard and soft rocks the same and there's about you can't see it here but there's about 25 feet of rounded rocks rounded by the action of water on top of that i'm on the other side here and you can see if you've got good eyes some of the rounded rocks but it's been dissected by the river coming through here anyway these planation surfaces have been dissected by by lake flood uh, channelized erosion and by post flood erosion but this is a planation surface much of the surface of the earth is a as, as planation surfaces you have them here in colorado now if this surface was kind of rolling it'd be called an erosion surface which you have here in colorado and places so here's a summary of this if we expected uniformitarianism slow erosion over millions of years the hard sedimentary rocks that are tilting would be ridges they'd erode slower right but the softer rocks would erode fast and become valleys so that's what you should see everywhere you should not see planation surfaces because they're not forming today they're formed by something that happened in the past something that happened in the past and this is what we commonly see tilted hardened soft sedimentary rocks that are sheared off at the same angle leaving rounded rocks from water action on the top indicating that these were formed by erosion of water moving at high speed to shear off soft and hard rocks the same that's planation surface and you see those in a lot of places now when you have a flood uh, floods don't erode everything out they leave erosional remnants 
Like here was a flash flood in South Africa and it eroded this field. But Lord, notice this, it left a few uh, erosional remnants of various sizes. Well, that's exactly what you see with the Genesis flood as it, as it run, ran off. That it didn't erode everything flat. It did in a lot of places, but then it has these tall erosional remnants left. And why it didn't erode that? Maybe it's because it was a little harder. I don't know, but here's a little schematic of that. Uh, thick sediments. They're rose eroding during the sheet flow phase, like this. There they go down. And they keep going. Oh, they leave a few erosional remnants. Those are about 1,200 feet tall. Monument Valley. And you see other erosional remnants around. Does anyone recognize this? Not far away from here. Ship Rock, Northwest um, New Mexico. It's 1,700 feet tall. It is the throat of a volcano that came up through sedimentary rocks like that and spread out the, uh, like that, way up high in the air above this slide. And it eroded, leaving this erosional remnant of the throat of the volcano. My favorite erosional remnant is Devil's Tower, which is another throat of a volcano. It's 1,200 feet tall, about 1,000 feet wide. And it was the throat of a volcano where the liquid um, uh, magma was coming up through a, a rounded uh, conduit and up into the volcano, which, which would be probably up here. The volcano was probably up here. So all this was covered by sedimentary rocks. In fact, the, you go to this monument here, they'll say maybe it was two to three times as high as Devil's Tower, maybe right in here at the top of the sedimentary rocks. Then I ask you, uh, Devil's Tower has, has, hasn't changed width much in millions of years. They used to have a sign there, which I won't go into, but, um, uh, but they think it's been there for millions of years. It has hardly changed width but all the sedimentary rocks around it have eroded down. Does that make sense? It doesn't because vertical faces or steep slopes erode much faster than horizontal surfaces. In fact, if people who live around here hear rocks crashing down off Devil's Tower all every winter because it's uh, kind of like a basalt, it's not exactly. It's got joints that's charged jar for cracks in the rocks and you get water in the, in the cracks and what happens when it freezes so it's, it's it's knocking these blocks off all winter so devil's tower couldn't last more than i don't know maybe fifty thousand years at the most maybe ten thousand not very long it should be a pile of rock but it hasn't hardly changed width in millions of years anyway the best way to explain this is that during flood runoff, you eroded all the sedimentary rock, rocks around it very fast. But for some reason, this throw of the volcano was a little harder, or maybe it was in a, there was an eddy and it, the currents weren't as fast, so it didn't erode it. But so it left it as an erosional remnant, like we see in floods today. Strong evidence for the runoff of the floodwaters. And then in, in my area, Montana, uh, we have the Northern Rockies. And in the Northern Rockies, you have quartzite. It's a metamorphic sandstone. It's a sand, a sand that's been cemented, uh, probably with uh, the same material as in the, in the particles, which are quartz, um, silicon dioxide. And the cement fills up the, the pores, but it's still about 30%, 40% air in, in a, or water. But when you heat it up, 300 to 400 degrees centigrade, 500 degrees centigrade, it recrystallizes and fills up those pores and becomes a metamorphic rock called a quartzite. It's a metamorphic sandstone. And so the big picture is you had currents coming from off the ocean, hitting the northern rock, the Rockies, and it was pulverizing the soft rocks. The currents were going so fast, soft rocks pulverized, but these harder rocks uh, 
they they were rounded and carried far downstream. And this is generally where you find them in this area, the quartzite rocks in the western Montana and northern Idaho and central Idaho. And I have traced these quartzites uh, clear out into central Saskatchewan, out in North Dakota. It's supposed to be somehow in southwest Manitoba. Some of these quartzites are eroded from the western Rockies. The distance, I don't have a scale here. This is about 800 miles. They were transported 800 miles from their source in the Western Rockies, clear out of the plains by the billions of these things out in the high plains of Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, North Dakota, and South Dakota, Wyoming. And then as the Rockies expo were exposed above the floodwaters, it's gonna split the currents. So some are gonna continue on the east, and so we're going to go west back towards the Pacific Ocean. Remember, the, the ocean, the, the ocean basins are sinking as the mountains are going up. So the water is going to be rushing back. And it's carrying the quartzite rocks clear of the ocean. And I have found them uh, in Vancouver, Puget Sound area, even uh, all through the Columbia Gorge, even at the highest areas of the mountains is where I find them. Uh, now, here's a picture of a quartzite rock right here. This is a this is from on top of the gravelly mountains in Montana. It's on the top of, of mountains, about 10,000 feet altitude. You can see the texture of the quartzite. It's been uh, recrystallized, so it's kind of vitreous, they call it. And it's very hard. And on the top of this mountain, you find quartzites this big, transported from uh, central Idaho as the nearest source. And if you look closely, you can see all kinds of cracks on them. Can't see those very well, but I have other pictures I should have shown. But anyway, they, they have semi-circular cracks, which are called percussion marks. And percussion marks are not forming today on quartzite rocks, but the quartzite rocks I find from Washington to North Dakota have lots of percussion marks indicating powerful banging of rocks back and forth, tremendous turbulence. Anyway. The green areas is, is where I find them uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are essentially uh, Western Montana and Idaho. And here are areas where I find them right in here, all through the Puget Sound area mixed with the glacial debris right in there. And the interesting place, here's the Wallawa Mountains. They are found in the tops of the Wallawa Mountains, 8,000 feet. And here is, we hiked up to the top of one of uh, this, and this is the, the largest quartzite boulder we found. Notice well rounded by water. So as a, the big picture is, is the waters were rushing off, they were eroding, leaving erosional remnants, flattening the land, and moving the harder rocks way out there, hundreds of miles from their source. No river today can do this, especially when uh, the quartzites originated from west of the continental divide and are found by the billions east of the continental divide. And this is kind of a map of where we find them at the uh, east of the divide, at least especially at these plateau areas. Here's the Cypress Hills right here. Anyway, it's been dissected by glacial rivers. Anyway, I'm going quickly through this. Because this, what I am showing you is one whole talk's work. I hope I'm not uh, leaving out a lot of details. I, oh, I, I know I am. I'm leaving out a lot of details. But anyway, uh, I think I'm just going to skip uh, on ahead. And this is one location in the Teton Mountains of Wyoming at the top. We hiked up for three days. And it's a flat top mountain um, in the northern Teton Range. And, Look at all these rounded quartzites we found on the very top of the Teton Mountains. Now, if the quartzites didn't pop up over that. What it means is the quartzites were moved by the floodwaters like this. The Teton Mountains came up and carried some up with the mountains. That's what it means. So let's get back to the how much sediment is left. So we're still trying to figure out how the current Continental sediments, how much are there? And it's the amount of sediments that formed 
in the flooding stage for the first 150 days, how much sediment's collected? Well, we know 1,900 meters are loaded off, so we've got to add 1,900 meters. So we've got to add that to what was, is left now. And that's where we're running into problems because the estimates uh, vary too much. They don't, have, they don't have the same definitions as the Globe said project. And the older estimates had poor data. And they included various proportions of the continental margin, which we don't want them to include. We want to use the shoreline as the boundary, you see. And also a lot of them uh, don't include what's called pre-Cambrian sedimentary rock, some do. So it's a mismatch. So guess what? We're doing our own estimate, state by state. For, uh, for North America, that's our goal. It's gonna take a lot of time. And guess what? We've done it for Colorado. You wanna know how much average sedimentary rocks you have in Colorado left? And Dr. John Reed is the one spearheading this. And um, so I and Peter Clever from Great Falls, Montana are helping him. Anyway, now what we've done here is we've designed a template where anybody anywhere in the world can figure out how much sedimentary rock they have in their area, like a uh, country, uh, for us, a state. And so we did it for Colorado, just for you. And by the way, this is the first time I presented this and it might be kind of rough. It's not a very smooth polished talk yet. Anyway, it's a six step process. Now, don't worry about the details unless you're really interested in going through this somewhere else. Anyway, you acquire maps and well data from the Colorado Geological Survey. And here is the, the map, the basement uh, structure. Um, in, uh, it's, um, these are the yellow of the deep sedimentary basin and we are where we're right in here somewhere the denver basin here are the rocky mountains where you had this you used to have the sediment above on the rocky mountains that got eroded off during the flood and then as the rockies came up the, the sediments that were on top of it a lot of it just tilted up forming your nice flat irons and hog backs that you have in this area and so you have a, several other basins right in here Sandwash Basin and Pickyons Basin, Paradox Basin, so forth. And these are elevations um, uh, below sea level. These are below sea level, this map. So here we use well data. We got a hold of uh, lots of well data. In fact, I think in the Midwest, Dr. Reed has collected hundreds of wells. Uh, and we're seeing the, the basement rock, the, the, the upper crust in great detail. So calculating the thickness of the sedimentary rocks is just part of this. So here's just a summary of the well data. Anyway, you add all the wells, those are those green circles. So you add a lot of well data. It tells you a lot about how thick the sediments are. And to read this, this is above uh, the depth of the crystalline basement rock below sea level. That's important to know, below sea level. Like here is Southeast Colorado. It's called the Sierra Grande Uplift. <laughs> I don't think it shows on the surface because it's been uplifted uh, 3,000, this is in feet, 3,651 feet. All these numbers uh, are Precambrian surfaces. That's your crystalline basement relative to sea level. Like here, it's 2,000 feet, 2,065 feet below sea level. Here, it's 3,651 feet above sea level. That's the depth of the crystalline rocks that we have to have. And then you go to uh, step two. You enter all this data and this big mapping software, which I don't know anything about. Global Mapper and Surfer are the names of these programs that were used. And so you enter that in and you uh, redo it. 
I'm going to skip over this because I can't really see a lot of difference right here. But, and then you uh, create 3D basement maps. Uh, this is our our first attempt, and they're not. It's kind of crude what we were, were showing. Uh, so to read this, here's the scale in feet. Your sea level. This is below sea level. Here's your Denver Basin here. This white area are your Rocky Mountains that uh, have no sedimentary rocks on them. Zippo. Here is the San Juan Volcanics. And we wiped that out because we don't know if sedimentary rocks below them. And I think there is. That's why this is all a minimum so far. So that's why that's white there. We might have to revise that and add some sediments that are below the volcanic rocks. See, the San Juan Mountains are volcanic mountains in southwest uh, Colorado. And here's some deep basins. You can see uh, down here the green area would be 16,000 feet below sea level. See, it's green right in here, green there, a little bit right there. Let's, let's turn this around from east west. So you're looking on top of it. Turn it around and look at it from east west. See if that helps. We're looking towards the east. Here's your Rocky Mountains right in there, and your San Juan. Uh, volcanics. Here's the deep trough, deep, deep hole where the Picayons Basin is in west central Colorado. In northwest Colorado, we have the San Wash Basin. And you can see the altitude here, the green area, 16,000 feet below sea level. So Colorado, like Wyoming, and our, our are where the mountains rose and the valley sank down and filled with sediments as they were sinking down. So that's like Psalm 104 uh, 8, where the mountains rose, the valley sank down. You see that theme all over the earth, according to Lester King. And Wyoming is probably the best place you can see it, but also Colorado, you can see all this, and southwest Montana, where I live. So let's go to the, uh, the next step. We want the difference between the crystalline rock and the surface to find out how much sediment. So we did that. And we find that the average sediment thickness for Colorado is 1,931 meters. 1,931 meters. But if we didn't include all the igneous rocks, that is your granites and your gneisses of the, of the Colorado Rocky Mountain front and the San Juan Mountains, you'd have an average of 2,362 meters. All those deep basins, the Denver Basin that we're on right now, uh, all those would be 2,300 meters. And then we divided it up into the basins. You could see the various numbers. The Denver Basin, where we're at now, has an average of uh, 2,898 meters of, of sedimentary rock. We're on that much before you get the, the crystalline rocks of the upper crust. But some of the, the, the uh, basins out of the western Colorado, the Paradox Basin, it's up to 3449, the Picayons Basin, 4294, and the San Wash Basin, which goes into Wyoming, 5,265 seven meters of sedimentary rocks. So we calculate the volume and average, and we plot it up like this. Here's the areas where we don't have any data. Your Rocky Mountains and the San Juan Mountains. And here are the, the values we get for the sedimentary rocks. They're down to 20,000 feet deep in the Picayon space in, in that area right in there. So, 1900 meters. And we think from other states we have done, by the way, we're going to have a lot of trouble doing this when we go uh, in the, the Western US because you had a lot of upward vertical loss, uh, tectonics and then sinking and it's a mess. So it's gonna be very hard to figure out what the average sedimentary rocks are in the Western United States. But anyway, we feel that uh, Colorado is probably close to the average. So we feel that the average sedimentary rocks left on the continent is 2000 meters. So that means at the peak of the flood, you had 4,000 meters of sediment collected 
on the continents, on all the continents, as an average, 4,000 meters, right here. So what is that telling you about the early flood, the flooding stage? It's telling us a lot of things that are actually going to be very controversial, but we're looking at the raw sediments and we're arriving at this stuff. You know, I am taking it further, but my uh, others working with me, they don't want to go that far. And here are some of the deductions. Um, on day 150, you have an average thickness of about 4,000 meters. I, I don't see anywhere around that. That's going to be a very close number. We So you had to deposit on the continents. You deposited on the continents, but not, it's not in the present ocean. Uh, the average depth of the continents is about 4,000 meters below sea level. The average height of the continents is about 800 meters above. So you have all that sedimentary rocks high above the center of the earth and none in the oceans that are way down here. And you have to generate 4,000 meters of sediment in 150 days. 4,000 meters. You have to have a powerful erosion mechanism to generate 4,000 meters in 150 days. And you have to transport that to where we find it today and the 1,900 meters that was eroded off during the retreating stage. So that's telling me that it's looking like gold, that the continents and the oceans switched places during the flood. I didn't originate this, the, the late Roy Holt uh, was the first guy I, I've heard of this. You know, sediment runs downhill, and if the sedimentary rocks are high now and the Ocean bases have no sediment, they're low. And then when we apply that the continental crust, the continents were low, and the ocean basins were high, at least early in the flood, and, the, and it was eroded from the oceans. And another reason is that we can't generate it from North, uh, Mordek, or North America. We're not, um, we're only focusing on North America because that's what we know best. We're all from North America. I don't know about other. Uh, continents. So a little of the sediment came from North America, but it's here in North America. So the only obvious places that it had to arrive from the present ocean basins. Ooh, and there's some evidence for that, and that you got current directions called paleocurrent directions that come from off the oceans in many places, and you can't explain them with plate tectonics. Uh, some of these, some you can, some you can. So we do have evidence that that. Uh, some of the sediment, at least from the paleocurrent direction, came from the ocean. It implies that the continental crust was lower than the present ocean crust. But then we're going to get into all kinds of things, what's called isostatic isostasy, where, um, and I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> and then, then to drain the floodwaters, the continents, which were lower, came up. And it drained off into the present ocean basins for the sediments we have in the globe set project. These are deductions I don't think that uh, we can deny, even though the three people working with me don't want to even discuss it because it is, it's going to be radical. It's going to, uh, <laughs> anyway, another deduction is that most of the continental sediments remaining no matter whether you call them Paleozoic, Mesozoic, or even Cenozoic, are from early in the flood. Now, I am suggesting that, so you got to generate, you got to get the sediment up into the water column and spread out to North America, 4,000 meters. I think you can do it by impacts, which if they hit the, the upper crust, <clears throat> they'll blast out the rock. They'll blast it out. You don't have to erode up a surface, which I think is a very poor way of getting sediments from fast currents. But if you hit it with an impact, which there's evidence of 200 impact craters in flood sedimentary rocks. And by the way, that's a gross underestimate, I'd say. It's probably around, I bet, a thousand impacts we had during the flood. 
just like uh, all the solid bodies in the solar system are blasted by impact craters. The Earth couldn't have been missed, and I believe it had down near the flood. Impacts would be a great mechanism to blast up all the sediment up into the water and even beyond the air, and gravity will sink it down. So that's how you can generate your 4,000 meters of sediment. And the currents from an impact would be so fast, 200, 300 miles an hour, that you could form flat surfaces easy, like what's called the great unconformity, and great turbulence. And I think we might be able to explain some unique sedimentary rocks by this model. Much of the sedimentary rocks are fine particles. They've been beat down to fine particles, silt size, or sand that's called quartz aronite, special type of sand that, that apparently neither one of these are forming in very big quantities today. So it's against secular ideas of uniformitarianism. Maybe we can account for the fossil order out of this. I'm speculating. I'm speculating. So it's leaving us with a huge amount of research questions, which um, such as the origin of the great unconformity, the boundary between the, the crystalline upper crust and the sedimentary rocks on top, and isostatic effects. Continental crust is light, it is less dense. Ocean crust is heavy. So how come uh, the continental crust was lower? Well, because it. In this kind of field of geophysics, which Rob knows more about than me, you got to include the mantle and all this. You just can't include the crust. How does this affect the geological column? How does it affect mega sequences? We're not we're not really sure yet. How does the origin of the ocean crust get into this? All that basalt. Hmm, don't know. How do we explain mid-ocean ridges and fracture zones? We don't know. Anyway. That's enough. Anyway, um, I become, uh, I'm actually an atmospheric scientist and I never liked geology, but when I saw how much work we needed to do, I did, I've been studying it for 45 years and I've become passionate because it's the basis between evolution, which caused so many other things in this society and in the church. So I've written a number of books on geology, like Flood by Design, where they talk about the receding flood water shaping the sur surface shaping it, forming features that uniformitarianism can't explain. And so I'm passionate because, and I want to teach children about uh, this, so um, I and others have this series called Exploring with Mr. Hibb, in this case, Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb. It's a, it's a fun book for young people and old people alike, uh, cartoon character, so it's easy to read. I mean, I, we got exploring dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb, and we're working on one called Exploring the Ice Age with Mr. Hibb right now. Won't be out for two years. Don't hold your breath. And my newest book with Robert Carter, um, which I am very happy with. It, see, you should educate yourself in geology so that you can see these things. Colorado has some, some amazing geology. You could see it for yourself by just learning a little bit about geology. And so this is why we wrote this book, Biblical Geology 101, The Basics of Geology. So, and then if you want to focus in on the geology, uh, uh, Noah's Flood, uh, we, I and Dr. Reed go into this, talking about what, what was the pre-flood like? What was the early flood, late flood? And what happened after the flood caused by the flood, mainly the ice age, the woolly mammoths, that sort of thing. And of course, I, I mainly started with the Ice Age, got into geology and geophysics. Not really wanting to go there because I really love the weather. By the way, I, I do have a, a video on global warming. You don't know what, the, what I think is the data on global warming. Anyway, this is my main Ice Age book. And so I think that's enough for the advertisements. And uh, Peter, let me advance. I will just do it myself. Just go to questions and answers. So anyway, this is all new research. I'm kind of thinking that it's probably kind of complicated. My, my first feeling on giving this.
too complicated. Anyway, I thank you. And questions and answers. Okay, everybody, just hold your breath for a second. I'm going to turn this mic on. Check one, two, three. Okay. So if, if I handle it very gingerly, if you have a question, kind of let me know and I will try to um, I'll try to pick questions in the order I see them come up and uh, I will let, let me run the mic to you before you ask the question. So I'll hand the mic to you and you can ask the question. So um, and, and then the other mic will stand here behind the, the microphone that works. Uh, okay, so I see a question here. So real quick to begin with, you had given uh, some thickness numbers and you were saying that, you know, certain areas had a certain number of you know, feet or meters of sediment. I just want to verify that you were talking about those, you were calculating those numbers based on the amount of ocean sediments and depth and extent of ocean. The ones over sediment. Colorado or? Talking about the no, oceans. like along the coast. Yeah, that that those were in uh, that's from the Globeset pro, uh, project, and they're in meters. Oh, okay, and then the next I had another question. Um, when you were showing all the the plots of you were getting like you know seventeen thousand feet below sea level, yeah. those numbers was that from drill data? Are they drilling that deep? No. It's mostly seismic reflection. They they can bounce the wave back from off certain rock, and they can tell what the rock is. So you have a big difference between crystalline rocks and sedimentary rocks. That's how they find that data. That's how they found the ocean sediment data by any seismic uh, methods. And they they've drilled in some places, but not too many in the ocean. Can I walk around a little bit? <laughs> oh, 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 that's right. I don't have a microphone, do I? Well, thanks, Mike. That was an interesting talk. Uh, just a couple questions. So you're 4,000 uh, meters. meters of sediment mm -hmm. pre-flood. So uh, no, the, at the peak of the flood. At the peak of the flood. Okay. So, but you had to get that from the ocean Base, the pre ocean basin. The pre flood ocean basins. It's, sure. You see any other way I can get no, it? But my, so, my question <laughs> is uh, where, speculate where that sediment comes from. Now, if impacts uh, hit the present ocean basins that were higher and the present continents were ocean, it pulverized a lot of rock. And I haven't we haven't gone into this very deep. We're just coming to these conclusions. So we got all this basalt on the ocean crust and we don't know how that all figures in. So we're running into a lot of heavy water. Um, uh, as Dr. Reed said, I, I don't want to jump off that bridge yet until I get the, the estimate of the amount of sedimentary rocks on the, on the continents now in North America. So so let me ask another question. Yeah. Uh, so that sediment, in your speculation, would like meteorites to pulverize yeah. that sediment to get it and pushed up and into the water column. So the sediment, so and that's an observation. So on the continents that your map shows with all the, the, the nice deep basins that kind of surround all the continents, I love those maps. Yeah. Good. So like look at it. So let's take a look at maps then that are uh, deep sediment basins worldwide that have no sediment accumulating today. Just for example, that's generally the case. Because I've seen I've seen those maps, and and there's some thick basins, and there's no accumulation going on today. So right, you would speculate that those were filled during that flood flood runoff when it was. Runoff or when it was accumulating on the hundred, first 150. Yeah, 
Um, let's take this. Uh, it was accumulating in the first 150 days on North America, and the top, which is 1,900 meters, was eroded off, and it was moving rapidly off. And then it slowed when it hit deep water, it dropped its load and because the, the edges of the continents were dropping a lot. Right. So it filled up those, those big troughs. Right, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I'm talking about basins, maybe that are intercontinent basins that are not- Oh, intercontinental like in Colorado? Well, there's, they're all over. So there's many, like say uh, the Delaware Basin in New Mexico or uh, yeah. the Midland Basin, mm -hmm. you know, those. Um, those are huge again sediment basins yeah and they're not being accumulated today right so i'm just so the speculation is that those are filled during the first 150 days yes as, yes as that sediment's coming on filling those and then when it's sheet flooding back they they get eroded back the down top, but they're the top gets filled, eroded off but they're filled but they're filled so early in the flood the flooding stage in the first 150 days and that's what i found in this this talk these talks when i go through and people get lost where i'm at so I'm glad to hear this good feedback for me. I plan to give this talk in Portland on the 20th of August. And uh, I hope to present it at the International Conference on Creationism. Okay, got a couple questions. One from the live chat on the YouTube live feed. This is from Captain2278. Is the basalt in the current ocean basins from original creation or from a flood volcanic event? Uh, I'm going to say I don't know. Um, here's what I'm up against. We have uh, samples of what is believed to be pre-flood ocean crust in rock formations called ophiolites. And um, when you look at these, you have upper mantle rocks in, in general. Then you have um, uh, a type of flight basalt, but it never uh, hit the air or water. It's called gabbro. And you have basalt. That's a simplification of what these things are. But these are very similar to the ocean crust today. So I'm kind of wondering, and these ophelites have looked like they've been blasted up and out horizontally. Um, they're very interesting and there's a lot of confusion in these things. And it's almost looking like these are pieces of, could be pieces of pre-flood ocean crust. And if they are, it almost means that the basalt and, and uh, current ocean crust is pre-flood. I don't know, um, that's speculation. I don't like that. <laughs> and I got I to gotta learn a lot more about the ocean basin still to be able to answer it, this. See, you, you, you need to understand that we have the big picture of the flood, but we're working on the details and there's a lot of details to figure out. And, and some of them were just clueless on explaining some of these other things we have a good idea on don't let me be too pessimistic so that's where i'm at right now i i'm, gonna, I'm just going to summarize and say i don't know as far as the ocean crust in fact that's one of the things i ended, ended up with is i don't know how the ocean crust which is gabbro and basalt mainly uh figures in on all this okay uh then a question from the zoom uh meeting Denver on through Northeast Colorado to Western Nebraska are, are covered with lots of ice age blown sand. Below this sand, would you say there is a planation surface? And this calls this question comes from Paul Phelps. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, it appears that you had a lot of resistant rocks, like I, in my area, it's quartzite. In the southern and uh, central plains, it's called the Ogallaga Formation, 
And a lot of that is gravel, rounded gravel, some of it's quartzite, but other hard rocks from the Rockies. And it's been spread hundreds of miles out in the Rockies. Uh, you find it in West Texas and on the highest areas of West Texas. Um, so the top of that could be a planation surface, but it's certainly part of this uh, resistant rock spread long distances, hundreds of miles. And then it, it's, for some reason, it's eroded through the Colorado Front Range for some reason. Um, I don't quite know what, maybe Paul Phelps can figure that out. Um, so I, I do believe that the, it is a planation surface that's been capped by the Ogallaga Formation, but it's a rough one. So it says it's rough to be called an erosion surface. And so there probably was say a thousand feet of rock on top of this. It was eroded from the uh, curves coming off the Southern and Central Rockies. And as it was eroding, it spread a lot of gravel on the, on the top, just like uh, the Cypress Hills up there in Canada were near me, where it's a high plateau. It is a planation surface because it's dead flat. And it's capped by 75 feet of rounded quartzite rocks. 75 feet at the very, as a high plateau, 2,500 feet above the rivers to the south and north. That is a planation surface. Out here on the high plains, it's more of an erosion surface. And it would be eroded through the flood runoff. So, yes, I would generally agree. Make a long story. Sure. <laughs> Early in your talk, you spoke of the continents being surrounded by deep trenches filled with sediment. What's the thinking on the origin of the deep trenches surrounding the continents? Um, Okay, uh, I'm not talking about, uh, let's just go back to that picture. We're probably referring to, come on, where is it? Probably referring to this figure right there. These deep troughs right in here. Yes, that's it. Yeah, those are deep sea trenches, by the way, like the Mariana Trench. They're, they're, they're actually, the crust, this is the, uh, the crust right here, ocean crust, and it's sunk down vertically 15 kilometers. And that's a good question. What caused that? Because you can see where the, the crust thickens here when it hits the continent. And it's thin in the ocean. And so it sank right in this area and that accommodated the sediments coming off the continents, as the, the edges of the continents were sinking, filling up with sediment. I don't know why that, that occurs. I, I've thought about it looking, especially at this figure, because it happens over here too, along, practically along every continental margin. These are some of the deeper ones here. Uh, you can see how it goes all along the continental margin right in here, but some places are deeper than others, this dark black area is deeper than the light black area. And so that's another question. I don't know why that sunk. A very good question. I have pondered that. I pondered a lot of things for many years. Good question. You have more uh, questions from the Zoom people, Fred? I have one more from this section from the live chat on the YouTube channel. Okay. Okay, this is from Mando Man. The Giant's Causeway, a large basalt pillar wall, is at sea level and below. Did it erode down that far, far or did they begin that way? So again, that's the Giant Causeway, a large causeway. Basalt, that's, basalt that's, pillar wall. Yeah, basalt, basalt columns. That is like the Columbia River basalts uh, in Washington State, where, where I'm originally from. And um, yeah, it was spread out as lava, and then it eroded and left a lot of columns uh, and in a really new shape. We have several of these, uh, of course, there, across the earth, you have the Devil's Post Pile on the east side of the Sierras, which are columns that are out there. 
And um, the Columbia, uh, in eastern Washington, you see a lot of those columns. Some of these columns are 10 feet in diameter. These are cooling columns uh, after the lava flow, the salt lava. The salt is a type of lava that runs like water. Uh, it cooled and contracted. When it contracted, it cracked the rock in a hexagonal pattern. And that's what uh, uh, salt lava does when it cools. It forms patterns like that. In the case of the giant causeway, uh, it formed then much of it is eroded, showing the nice columns uh, vertically. They're a really interesting shape. Yeah, one other question. You said something about the continents and the ocean floors reversing position. Mm -hmm. That that couldn't be true in the case of the Middle East because you've got, like in Genesis chapter two, you've got four rivers mentioned, the Euphrates being one of them, and we still have the Euphrates. So oh, yeah. So perhaps that might you're suggesting that would be true of North America, but not of that. Asia Minor area? Um, we can only speak for North America. We know that the best, but other places. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, um, you don't see a pattern like the Garden of Eden where it comes up and it's spread in four different directions for four rivers, two of which the Tigris and Euphrates. You don't see that pattern anywhere. So this is, this is a pre-flood uh, uh, feature. But the reason that you have the Euphrates River and Tigris River today is because people leaving the Ark came to that region first uh, early. That's where the Tower of Babel is. And they just named them the rivers after the old country from the pre-flood world. Like in Montana, where I live, we have a lot of people from Holland. So we've got cities called Amsterdam, Churchill, Manhattan, and then people from Germany, there's a town called Ulm in uh, Montana. So, and, and, and then people from Scotland, Glasgow, Montana, or these Montana. So they name things after the old country. So that doesn't mean that this is a, a, a pre-flood signature. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah, I think so you're saying that what we call in phrase today is not Yes, yes. Because mm -hmm. it was typical people to name them after the old country. They're a very common feature. And I don't know if that's the exact question, but that's part of your question, or the answer to part of your question. And that, so uh, it doesn't t t tell me anything about pre flood or flood or post flood. And I haven't investigated it yet. I, we're just sticking to North America. This will take us a couple of months, we think, maybe six months to go through all the states. Dr. Reed is finding some tremendous stuff out in the Midwest. You know that there's a big canyon in the Midwest that goes from eastern Kansas to uh, Nebraska, and it's not connected. It's, uh, it's deep. It's about... Um, something like five times the depth of Grand Canyon <laughs> in Kansas. Actually, there's a ridge there, then it continues in Nebraska and goes all the way up through Lake Superior and comes down to Michigan. It's called the Mid-Continental Rift. It's a big crack. It's, um, it's I'm, giving, I'm guessing, 40 miles wide and maybe about eight miles deep, 10 miles deep filled with sediments and volcanic material. He, that is showing up very well when we're looking at the uh, what's called the, uh, the crystalline rock. We're showing, so we're finding out some really interesting features that we haven't really put our head to. See, this is a research project that's going to go on for years and years. Sorry to tell you that, but research is a slow, painful business. Slow and painful. Painful because when you try to publish it, <laughs> I get a lot of red ink back on my papers. So I got to fix them or project them. 
That's the way research works. So I hope that answers your question. There was a question back there. Yeah, I have two questions. Okay. Um, my first one is how did you get interested in geology? Okay. Well, I got interested because I worked on the ice age. See, the ice age is more in my field of atmospheric science, but everything is interdisciplinary, just not a narrow area of atmospheric science. It got into geology, like moraines, scratch bedrock, evidence of, of glaciation. Uh, so it got into things like that, erosion. Uh, so I got interested in geology and especially found out how needed we are needful we are in the field of geology because geology is kind of the framework uh, for evolution millions of years it has greatly affected the church or society and it causes so many problems a lot of people don't know it see that's the funny thing about all this this is all kind of escaping the average person that's why i am passionate about geology and i want young people a middle age old people whatever to learn about geology. And if you learn just a little bit, you can see it for yourself. And when you see it out there, uh, traveling around what we call it the field, it really hits home. Hey, there was a Genesis flood. And hey, I can trust the Bible. So that's why I got passionate about geology and still am, even though at the beginning, I disliked the field of geology. <laughs> but, it, so that's that's kind of been a my the way I got into this. And my second question is, um, do you know how many cubic miles of sediment um, deposit off a certain coast? Like you said, I believe uh, fifteen thousand meters uh, off of a certain coast, and I'm pretty sure ten thousand is taller than Mount Everest. So do you know? How many cubic miles of sediments for a certain area? Um, we would have those numbers in uh, this table right here. Now this is in cubic kilometers, which is smaller than a uh, cubic mile. And these are the numbers. This is the sediment volume to 10 to the six uh, cubic kilometers. Is the total ocean broken down into the continental margin, the area between the margin and the deep ocean right here, and the deep ocean. And this is the area. This is the beam thickness right here. Um, so you can translate that into cubic miles. And I, just to wing it, I would say that um, the total volume of sediment along the continental margin, right along the edge, uh, 143 times 10 to the sixth power of cubic kilometers is probably somewhere around 30 million cubic miles, just off the top of my head. 30 million cubic miles of sediment eroded off the continents ending up mainly along the edge. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, I have uh, been interested in Walt Brown oh. and his hydroplate theory. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that Many, much of the original sedimentation in that upward curve of your graph on that one chart would probably be coming from the initial fountain, great fountains of the deep. Is, is that your supposition as well? Mm, I see things quite different than Walt Brown, by the way. Uh, I'm sure that's true. I mean, it's, it's a theory. Yeah, he believes a lot that. Proves out. So he believes that the jets of water coming from 16 miles down came up to the mid ocean ridges and way up. And that uh, uh, did erosion while it was moving past, which is reasonable. Then it spread out, forming the sediments. That's what he would say. Um, 
Could he explain this pattern by that? Off the top of my head, yeah, I'd say his model could do it. But I see lots of problems with this model. And by the way, I was out in the field of uh, Walt Brown um, five days uh, trying to figure out the origin of the Grand Canyon together. And I discovered out there that unfortunately, Walt knows very little about geology because, I mean, he said a number of things that just kind of blew me away. Um, one of them was he believed that the Grand Staircase, you know what that is? How many know what the Grand Staircase is? Or the Grand Canyon and those cliffs, uh, like uh, a sandstone, then you have shales for road, that's the step, and then you have another one. It's a series of those. About six, five or six of them. He believed that those were faulted. Up. Same with the road and book cliffs along the edges, north and edge of the San Rafael Swift. Those are not <laughs> faults. They're erosional features. And it's really easy to tell because uh, when you got a stair like this, you got a sandstone right in here, all you have to do is go into a side canyon. And you find the same strata that goes right underneath it. And so it's the same strata underneath it. So it's been eroded, not folded up. You have different strata. So I discovered that uh, in person. And we had a really friendly discussion with about 10 other creation scientists. It was rather interesting. And but so anyway, that's one of the many, many problems I, I find with Paul Brown's. Uh, theory on the flood. Sorry to inform you about that. I I wish him or Baumgartner or those guys were correct, and I can stick with geomorphology or the Ice Age. But I get myself into these because I read, try to read fifty uh, earth science journals, and so I I find problems for even catastrophic plate tectonic problems. So anyway, but, but don't feel bad because. What I believe uh, impacts followed by differential vertical tectonics has problems also. All flood models have problems. In fact, we had a um, uh, an online um, give and take where about seven models were presented and um, ten objective uh, creation scientists asked questions of people about these models, and so we. You can find this called the Flood Science Review. And that showed to the person who started this, Joe Bardwell, that none of the flood models were adequate yet. And I would agree with that. We need a lot more research to in the flood. Okay, well, it's starting to get quite late here. So um, why don't we go ahead and cut it off unless somebody's got a really burning question. Um, so, I don't see anything like that. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and wrap it up and uh, let's have a final round of applause for Mike Ward.